Okay, so welcome back. So the, this afternoon we will have three more talks. The first two primarily on optimization and then we will go back to control. So uh, the first talk is by uh, Paul Goulart from Oxford and he will talk about the new interior point conic optimization solver. Okay, thanks. Um, right, thanks very much. So um, like the title says, I'm going to tell you about um, interior point optimization for cone programs. Um, but I'm actually from the control group in uh, engineering in Oxford. So I was really happy to see the two previous speakers talk about control, because now I don't feel like I need to talk about control, which I won't. But rather, I'm just going to only talk about optimization. Um, and this is work that was, the talk is going to be, roughly speaking, in two parts. The first half is about just a, a, a new interior point algorithm uh, and its implementation. And that's joint work with uh, Yuan Chen. And then the second part will be about um, semi-definite programming. Uh, specifically for that solver. So this um, okay. So this this workshop has optimization in the first word of the uh, of the title. So I, I feel I don't necessarily need to sell you on convex optimization. But we heard at least in the previous talks that lots of people want to do convex optimization. In many applications, it eventually boils down to solving a convex problem. And so I will just point out a couple of applications. Not necessarily the most common, but at least the ones I worked on. And they, they fall into kind of two parts. One is in control. In particular, you have lots of linear optimal control, uh, sometimes constrained quadratic programming uh, for optimal control. And that has loads of applications, some of which we've done, like uh, controlling this uh, particle accelerator here in Oxford. Um, and then there's things like optimal power flow and, and building control and so on. And then you see it in lots of other applications like finance and so on. And so the reason why I show you these pictures is, uh, to, is to say to you that when you do optimal control, or so when you do optimization for control, you have to worry not just about uh, speed and efficiency and so on, but you should also worry about things like um, memory safety and, and uh, you know, making your code um, efficient in terms of memory allocation and reallocation and so on. So some of the stuff that I'll show you for our um, optimization work has, has that very much in mind, making your code safe for use uh, in embedded systems. And then the second bit here, um, the indirect uh, uses of optimization, or of convex optimization, would be things like um, Bayesian optimization, or we've done some stuff on uh, stability analysis of flows. And many of those things boil down to solving really big semi-definite programs. So that's the motivation uh, for the second bit of the talk. And I'll just, this, this is an Easter egg for Bartolomeo. This is taken directly from your thesis, <laughs> just as a, as a nod to you. Okay, so I'm going to start just by showing you a, a standard form convex <laughs> optimization problem. My claim is that basically any reasonable convex optimization problem can be written like this. So we have a quadratic objective. The only constraint is that P should be semi-definite, could be zero. And we have some constraint AX plus S is equal to B, where A is some matrix, doesn't have to have any special properties. And S has to live in some cone. So depending on the choice of cone, you get a different flavor of optimization problem. So if S is in the zero cone, I just have AX equals B. That's an equality constrained problem. If I say S has to be non-negative, that amounts to AX less than B. That's a QP or an LP if you make P zero. And then you have other more exotic ones, like I can say that um, this S has to be a vector which is composed of some upper bound T and some vector U. And then I say that the two norm of U has to be upper bounded by T. That's a constraint that looks like an ice cream cone. That's a second order cone. I could do things like uh, energy bounds and things like this. Uh, or this big one here, uh, S can be um, in the semi-definite cone. But there are many others that I could think about. So we can have exponential cones, power cones, generalized power cones, relative entropy cones. There's a long list of different types of cones that one might want to implement. And the nice thing about these, uh, at least these bottom three, is that they're all symmetric in the sense that uh, the dual cone of each of these is itself. So the dual, if you don't know much about optimization, the dual cone is basically where the multiplier for this constraint will have to live. So if S is the positive orthant, then the multiplier for that constraint will also be in the positive orthant. So it's not always like that. In fact, those are the only sort of reasonably useful ones that are um, self-dual like that. We also can have support for other types of cones. I'll just name two. It doesn't matter what the details of these equations are on the slide, just to point out to you that there's other flavors of cones that have things like exponentials in them uh, or powers in them. And for those cones, we have the cone itself, and then its dual cone is some slightly different thing. 
And so in that case, if S lives in this set here, then the multiplier of S has to live in this other set. And I can, get a, I can go a really long way with just these ingredients. I mentioned that you can have a generalized power cone. I can have something like products of things that look like that in many ther terms along the chain. But I can actually just remodel anything like that um, in terms of a collection of constraints like this. So that's my basic um, problem statement. I want to solve optimization problems with variables that live in these cones. And in order to come up with a reasonable algorithm, I need uh, one other thing. I need to have some barrier function for my cone. So I need to have some function f that takes an element of the cone and produces for me a value. And the barrier should get really big when I approach the edge of the cone. And if my cone has uh, a dual cone, k star, then I need also some conjugate function for it. And broadly speaking, you're able to solve problems in this form if your cones are what are called, um, or your barrier functions are uh, logarithmically homogeneous and self-concordant. So what does that mean? It means that if your uh, cone is the non-negative orthonth, then you just take this barrier function f to be uh, the sum of the logs. And that cone is self-dual, so its conjugate barrier is just the same function again. And then it has this homogeneity property. So if you have these ingredients, then you can cook up a reasonably efficient interior point algorithm. There's loads of theory about this. This is not my idea. I'm just trying to state for you the, the problem statement. So I have f, I have k, I have k star, I have a quadratic objective. <laughs> what can I do? So what I want to show you is an interior point um, algorithm and code that we came up with for this problem, um, which many of you have probably actually used. How many people use CBXPy? Okay. Wow. Okay. You've, prob you've probably all used this code that I'm about to show you. Um, well, one thing I learned is that uh, if you want your code, if you want your, your optimization work to be impactful, it doesn't matter if it's any good. You just want to be the default, right? So if you use CBX5, <laughs> we're the default. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you how this interior point method works, and I'm going to start by showing you um, a sort of standard embedding that people use for interior point problems. So let's let's start with my problem here. So I have um, minimized my quadratic function. I have ax plus s is equal to b. S is in the cone. And what's the dual of this problem? The dual is this uh, maximization problem over here. So how can I go about solving this problem? The way many interior point algorithms work is you try to solve, if you like, both of these at the same time. And you do this by um, assuming initially that p is 0. So I'm going to assume to start that p is 0. This is not our strategy. I'm going to try to explain to you why that's a bad idea. And what do you do if p isn't 0? then what you do is you take this quadratic term here and you just put it um, into the constraints with an upper bound and then you minimize that upper bound. And then you have an upper bound and Q transpose X, that's all linear, but what you've added is a second order cone constraint. And if you do that, then you would have um, a problem with just a linear objective and you can use this thing called the homogeneous self-dual embedding. So I want to show you what that is. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the P's out so that would require me to, to remodel my problem a little bit by changing A, by having some different constraints. And now I'm going to rewrite it as a feasibility problem. So my feasibility problem is just satisfy all the constraints from the primal and from the dual. I'm going to set the two objective functions equal to each other. So if the problem is self-dual, sorry, if the problem is um, strongly dual, then the primal objective and the dual objective should be equal at optimality. And so that uh, duality gap will be zero. And I want S, which is my slack for my first problem, that's that one there, and Z, which is the multiplier that goes with it, they should just live in the correct cones. And minimize zero, because I'm just trying to find any point that solves this problem. And so this is just a feasibility problem. You find any set of variables that solve that, you're done. The problem is that if the problem is not feasible, if the primal is infeasible or the dual is infeasible, then this is not going to be feasible. And if I try to implement some algorithm for it, it might blow up in my so what I can do is I can remodel it a little bit. I have that zero duality gap condition. I'm just going to change it a little bit by scaling uh, b by tau and c by tau and adding this minus kappa term. And now it turns out that I have a problem which is very special in two ways. The first way is that this problem is always feasible. And 
if I get a solution with tau non-zero, I can recover a solution to the problem that I started with. If I get kappa non-zero and tau zero, then what I have is a proof that the original problem is not itself feasible. And then the other nice thing about it is that it is the dual of itself. So, and finally, it's homogeneous. So I can scale all the variables by some value. It remains a solution to the problem. That's the homogeneous part. It's the dual of itself. And it is either going to give me a solution to the problem I started with, or it's going to give me a proof that that problem is not solved. Okay, so let me put it up there. So this is always feasible. It's the dual of itself, and I just look at the solution I get, and I either get an answer or I get a proof that the problem is not solvable. Okay, great. Um, what's the problem with this is that um, I have to get rid of P to do that. So if I keep the P in there, I can't make uh, a self-dual problem in such a nice way. But okay, let's just stick with that for a minute. So if I have this problem, how should I solve it? I would solve it in the following way. Instead of minimizing zero, let me just write down this complementarity condition. And the complementarity condition is basically the same as the zero gap condition. So I'm saying that at optimality, then um, my slack S and its multiplier Z should be orthogonal to each other. And try to find any solution to this set of equations. Okay, so that's what I want to do. I can do it using some kind of modified uh, Newton-like method, but this is kind of an awkward looking condition. And so what is done in interior point methods is to define something called the central path. And what I do is I go back to this barrier function and I say that for every value mu, I just inject, instead of this orthogonality condition I have, I inject this new condition which says that z has to be equal to mu times the gradient of my barrier at s, and likewise the other way around. So you can imagine that as I reduce mu, I get a sequence of solutions, and that sequence will converge to the optimal solution for the problem I wanted to solve at the start. And how does an interior point method work? Well, basically it's just apply Newton's method to this system of equations, and keep reducing mu until you eventually converge to something. That's like a super short sketch of, of interior point. Okay, so great. So that's, that's like all standard stuff. Um, what can I do if I don't want to remove this p from my objective? So let me now just put it back. So the only difference here is that I have, I've just put, I've just put the quadratic term back into the objective, and it also appears in the, in the dual constraints. And let me just see what would happen if I tried to homogenize this problem in the same way as I did before. So I can, again, rewrite it as a feasibility problem. So my step before was to just write down the conditions for both problems, and then say that I have a zero duality gap um, condition here. And I'm going to, at the same time, add these uh, tau and kappa scaling variables. And so my zero duality gap condition is now this. And if you look at this, then you should say that is gross because one over tau x squared is not something that you really want to see appearing in a problem for which you apply Newton's method. Particularly because I told you that the tau might go to zero. But okay, fine, we're optimists, we'll press on. What would happen if I tried to solve this problem instead? Then. I would be minimizing zero subject to all of these constraints. And it turns out, without getting into all the details about why any of this works, this problem is also always feasible. So if my original problem is infeasible, I will get a solution there with tau zero, kappa non-zero. If my original problem is feasible, I'll get one with tau non-zero, kappa zero. And the only thing that I've given up is that the problem isn't the dual of itself. Okay, it's still homogeneous. I can still scale solutions to get other solutions. I still get these nice certificates. And great. So that's what I want to do. Yeah. So wait, quick question. Yeah. Well, how do you interpret tau equals zero in this context? Because you have one over tau in one of the constraints. Uh, OK, so if I put tau equals zero in there, then I interpret it as, as bad news. Right? I don't want to do that. But what I can do is I can prove instead that um, the, if, so, okay, so if I have a feasible um, initial problem, the tau will be non-zero. 
So let's take the infeasible case only. Then what happens is that you can ask what is the limit of points on the central path as mu goes to zero. And it turns out that those are well behaved and everything remains bounded. And the reason why that happens is because uh, px also goes to zero. Um, and it's kind of obvious, like in the, if you have a, um, um, which way around is it? Either a primal or a dual infeasible problem, it's clear that px should be zero. I can't remember which way around it is, but. Um, okay, so what, what's my method now? Now I want to apply Newton's method to that. What would that look like? So I have an interior point method. I'm going to apply Newton's method for decreasing values of mu. And I should solve at every step something that looks like that. And like the details don't matter, it's just a standard Newton step. The only thing to watch out for is that I have now this funny looking term here, and I have some residuals which depend a little bit on my Newton-like strategy. Am I taking a centering direction? Am I trying to find a, uh, a, a solution to the, the kind of KKT conditions in the original form? And I have this block H, and H is the Hessian of the barrier function that I showed you at the start. So I would like to solve this system of equations, but it looks kind of bad because it's not symmetric. There's nothing really nice about it. But what I can do is I can reduce it by eliminating some of the variables and get it down to a two by two system that looks like that. And now what's special about this system here? P is a semi-definite matrix. H is a negative definite matrix. And the whole thing is symmetric. So if I want to solve this system of equations, what I can do is I can shift the spectrum of P up slightly, and the spectrum of H down slightly if I want. And then I get um, a type of matrix called a quasi-definite matrix. And the nice thing about that is if I factor it, I can uh, pre-compute the sparsity pattern of its factors and be sure that that's going to work uh, in, a, in a very similar way that the Kolesky decomposition works. So what I'm going to do in the end is solve a system of equations that looks like this over and over and over again as I iterate. And the only thing that changes is H. And because I can pre-compute the sparsity fact of pattern of any matrix in that form, I only have to allocate memory once up front, and I don't have to worry about pivoting or anything uh, special like this. So that's our method. Solve that using Newton's method. I mean, there's lots of like. What is that three? Sorry. Is it trivial to see from top to bottom? Um, I mean, it's it's trivial to. It's semi-trivial. I mean, it's, you can see that you've got PA transpose minus A, and then you substitute for S. That's where the H comes from. It's not entirely obvious. That you, but it's, yeah. OK, so why, like, why am I making a big deal out of it? This is, this is a really nice matrix to factor, because I haven't done anything weird to my problem data. And if I shift the spectrum of P up a little bit, then um, you can give me any A you like, and it will still work. So you can give me redundant rows of A, you can give me zero rows. It can be all kinds of bad stuff that people put into optimization problems, and it will still be solvable. And so this is what we did. So we, we made a solver that just uses this method instead of the standard uh, self-dual embedding. And we made some uh, solver package out of it. So that package is called Clarabel. And it says .jl and .rs, which I'll come back to in a minute. And it just implements a standard, uh, what's called a predictor corrector interior point algorithm. So the predictor step roughly tries to solve the KKD conditions, the corrector step, I'm sorry, the predictor, one of the steps tries to take you towards the central path, one of the steps tries to take you directly towards optimality, and then you try to blend them together in a nice way to get uh, good behavior. So most of the machinery in that is very similar to stuff that already exists. So um, the method is very close to what's in CVXOpt, which is written in Python, uh, or ECOS, which um, is a, a second order cone solver. Uh, written in C. We do direct uh, LDL factorization for factoring this matrix, and we do Marotra-like method for the strategy. We do nesterov todd scaling. We do some uh, equilibration of our problem data ahead of time to get it to behave a little bit better, but that's all more or less taken out of these other solvers. Um, but it's really fast. And why is it really fast? Yes? Where does the scaling come in? Is that in the scaling situation? comes from, I can, I can um, apply a scaling to the variables x. Uh, or to the rows of AX plus S is equal to B. And I do that uh, in an effort to make this matrix have row and column norms that are all close to one. But that rescaling doesn't affect the factorization sparsity? No. No. Okay. No. 
I mean, when, when we check for convergence, we have to unscale everything to make sure that it's all fine still. Um, but it, it just makes everything slightly better behaved. What I want to say to you is that the reason why this is so much faster is if I go back to the self-dual embedding idea when I have no quadratic cost, if I had taken the quadratic cost out and made it into a constraint, then what would have happened is I would have had to add an additional collection of rows to A. And I would have to do that by making a second order cone constraint which requires factoring P. So here I have the square root of P. And then in order to solve that set of equations, I have to factor it again. So I somehow, in some sense, take the fourth root of P. So if P is anything other than diagonal, I'm going to get loads of fill-in here when I factor, and that's going to happen twice. So our method ends up being faster for two reasons. One is that every step is faster to compute, because the, the matrix is smaller, and the factors tend to be sparser. That's kind of queer from this. Um, but the other reason is it also ends up taking a lot fewer iterations than if I had done this. OK, so I'm not going to talk any bit anymore about the method there. Now what I want to do is just show you some results. So we made this solver called uh, Clarabel. It's written in two languages. There's, there's two um, mostly identical implementations, one in Julia and one in Rust. And it's all public. If you go to clarabel.org, you will get uh, this website. We have this, this uh, cow logo to emphasize the, uh, the speed and, and technical uh, skill and gone to this uh, solver. Um, and well, you can just go there and there's instructions about how to use it in, in uh, Rust or in Julia or we have a Python interface for it, which is how it's in CDXPy. There's, there's an R interface, there's a C and a C++ interface and so on. And most of these are very easy to use. In R, Rust, Julia or Python, it's a one line installation to get it to work. So, okay, now I just want to show you briefly what it looks like. So I have this example problem. Here's a really small QP. And I have two constraints. I have a two-sided interval constraint and an equality. And first I need to put it into my standard form. So that's my standard form, quadratic objective and uh, AX uh, plus S is equal to the right-hand side. So I would have to add a slack here to um, make everything into an equality. What does that look like in Julia? It looks like that. You can just write down your problem and say solve. And we put a lot of effort into trying to make the Julia code and the Rust code look more or less identical. So there's the Rust version, and it looks basically the same. And it produces the same output, even though it's written in uh, two different um, languages. And internally, it's very similar. If you look internally at pretty much any part of the code, it's more or less copy-paste from Julia into Rust. The nice thing about Rust is that um, you can run it on an embedded system, and it has loads of really nice guarantees about memory safety. It's really, it's a really interesting language because in C, if you don't know what you're doing, it's really easy to make a memory leak. In Rust, unless you are extremely good at it, it's really hard to make a memory leak. You have to like really go out of your way to make it leak memory. And so that's nice for an embedded system. And then um, the Python version again is basically the same. So we're trying to make everything always look nice like this. And I'll say a bit also about uh, the implementation. So everything that I described so far was based on that standard form problem that I, I wrote down. But we tried to implement it in such a way that you can change your code or re-implement parts of it so that it will work for particular problem Classes. So it's very modular. If any of you are familiar with the OQP solver, which was from um, Madison, maybe 20 years ago, that was written in a very similar way. So we have this core solver component, and it just operates on these abstract data objects. And it says, compute my residuals for me, add two variables in some kind of abstract form together, can solve the KKT system, and so on. And so you could, if you wanted to, take the pieces that we wrote and just remove them and say, look, my problem is a support vector machine problem or an optimal control problem. And you could just plug in new components and exploit the fact that you know something about the internal structure. And that would be particularly useful for the KKT system. If you know that your linear system to solve at every step has a nice internal structure, like for an optimal control problem, it would be banded, then you could just re-implement it and exploit that internal structure. And you get the same 
answer in the end. It would just go faster. And so we've, we've started to do a little bit of that uh, in the code that's um, public. So just as an example, if I take just my solving my KKT system, and that's the big um, set of equations with my five variables to make my Newton step, then that is solved in uh, two steps. One is to reduce it to some uh, LDL factorizable form. That was the first step that I showed you, the two by two system. And then you need to pass that to some um, LDL solver. And you could have done that in a different way. I didn't have to reduce it to this quasi-definite form. I could have reduced it one more time to get a positive definite form. Uh, or when I have my quasi-definite form, I don't have to use the code that we provide standard, but I could use Pardiso or uh, fair.rs as a solver in Rust or um, sweet sparse or whatever. And so we provide support for all of those different things and you can try different linear solvers if you want. And also we started to experiment a little bit with uh, GPU solvers at that step instead, mixed precision and so on. So I'll show you at least a GPU result um, in a moment. So our, our development process is kind of weird. So what we do is we make our prototype in Julia, and Julia, how many have used Julia? Oh, amazing, right? Usually not that many hands go up. Julia is really nice because it looks a lot like MATLAB and you can convince students to use it. But it's also nice um, because if you are reasonably proficient at it, then the speed that you get out of it is more or less the same as uh, if you'd written it in C or some other um, compilable uh, language. So we do all of our prototyping in Julia, and then once it works, then we port it to Rust, uh, which is less student-friendly, so I usually do that bit. And then uh, we use a thing called PyO3 to make a Python wrapper for it, and that's how we get the CDXPy interface. So there's actually no Python code at all. It's actually all written in Rust, and we just get a, um, a Python interface for it. And then we also provide C and C++ wrappers, and from that, you can use it, for example, in Drake, which is a, a robotics toolbox at MIT, or uh, we're working on a MATLAB interface now, and so on. And why do we do it this way? We do it this way, um, well, because everything is, it doesn't, it's not twice as much work to do it this way. It's, you write the stuff in Julia, it's very easy to check what's going on, and then once you're happy with it, translating it to Rust is usually like the job of maybe an hour. And the Julia version fixes all the math problems. If something doesn't work, it's really easy to check the eigenvalues or whatever, look at the sparsity pattern of your matrix. But the Rust compiler is really opinionated about things. And if you try to implement something in an unsafe way, it's, it will let you know that it doesn't like what you're doing. And so when we have code problems or code, um, uh, let's say, um, stylistic code issues with the compiler, then we go back and we fix the Julia one. So the code is like really tightly written because we've got these um, two different uh, sort of masters, so to speak. Okay, so now I'll show you some uh, results. So how well does it work? So. Um, what we did was we tried to get as many benchmark problems as we could for QPs, second order cone programs, exponential cones, SDPs, all these different problem classes. And we tried to only use things that are public. We don't want to make up problems because people would just say, well, you just showed us the problems that you made up. So I'm going to show you a couple of standard benchmarks. And we have here results for our own code, both in Rust and Julia, and then a bunch of other interior point codes and commercial codes. I'm not going to show you any um, First order codes like SCS or, eight or uh, OSQP, sorry. Still looks pretty good compared to those. But I, wa I want to do things that only give me high precision um, solutions. So I'll just show you one plot here. This is uh, called a performance profile. Have you seen one like this before? Okay, so what it, what it says is if I pick, pick like the green one here, if I get a point there, which is roughly uh, 3 and uh, 0.7, it says that that solver was able to solve 70% of the problems in an amount of time, uh, a factor of three or less than whatever was the best solver for that particular problem. So the ideal case is that you're always the fastest solver. So 100% of the time, you have a performance ratio of one, which means that you were the best. And for these uh, predictive control benchmarks, so these are problems that are uh, finite horizon, optimal control, linear constraints, quadratic objective. The red one, which is the rust one, is best pretty much every time. The Julia one is a little bit slower. That's mostly overheads for really small problems. And then what else have we got? Green is uh, Garobi, that's here. Um, the dark purple one is Ecos. And then uh, Highs, which is a C one, 
from the University of Edinburgh, and then Hypatia is the Julia one, and then Mosaic is there. And some of these don't solve the optimality mostly because they time out. So this is kind of the best case for us, and this is where we're fastest because there was a quadratic objective. And so we end up right there in the upper left-hand corner. It's not always that good. You should lead with the best result. Okay. Um, but let me show you a few others. So, so that's predictive control problems. That's really good for us because we're interested in embedded control. This Maros Mazaros QP data set is a collection of nasty QP problems that everyone struggles with all the time. We do really well with those. We can't solve all of them. Nobody can solve all of them. Um, then we've got a bunch of uh, sort of regression problems where we take um, some sort of, uh, let's say, least squares problem, but with either a Huber objective or a lasso type objective. Those are all um, quadratic problems, so again, we do really well. But even for the non-quadratic problems, we do well. So here's a bunch of exponential cone problems from CBLib. Uh, here's a bunch of second order cone problems from CBLib. And generally, we're up and to the left. That's good, yes? Do those last two rows have quadratic objectives also? No. What, what I will say, the caveat is that here, um, everything is single-threaded. The results look basically the same, even if you allow the other solvers to be multi-threaded. The, the linear solver that we're using here is only single-threaded. We support multi-threaded ones, but we didn't use it here. Uh, but the thing that we have disabled is that we've disabled the pre-solver and everything. So if I were to turn the Garobi pre-solver on, then it's a different story. It looks really good. Um, but we did it this way, one, because on an embedded system, you shouldn't pre-solve, because if you eliminate a constraint, now, and then you change the problem slightly, you can't go back and recover the constraints that you eliminated. And also because I want to compare like for like. Uh, but like, you know, in real world example, if you just sit down at your desk and, and try things, you may find the Kurobi is faster. Now, the reason why we're faster here is because we have a quadratic objective. But what if I have a linear objective? What happens then? So here I have what's called the Netlib um, uh, linear programming problems, and there's a feasible set. The ones on the top left are all ones that are solvable. The ones on the top right are ones that you have to prove are not solvable. And they're, okay, we're not the fastest, but at least we're in the conversation at least. And it's not always like that. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, optimal power flow uh, DC problems, which turn out to be LPs, and there, again, we do really well. And I'll show you one more, which is I said that I can remove the linear solver and just drop in any other one. And so we've been working on uh, putting in uh, a GPU-based solver. So we use the direct um, LDL solver that's in, uh, provided by NVIDIA. And then we get uh, a situation like that. So these are optimal power flow second order cone problems. And we're top every single time. OK, so that's the first half. Anybody want to ask a question about that? Yes. Do you have any intuition why the DC LPF works better than general LP? Um, no. Okay. At least the answer was short. <laughs> yeah. So it seems the second conclusion here is that Mosaic really needs a pre solver. Right? Oh, no, no, sorry. So let, let me be clear. Mosaic has a pre solver and we turned yeah. it off. Yeah. yeah but no. you turned it off and it suddenly gets really bad. So I wonder if you have any idea why that is. If you turn off all the pre solvers, why Mosaic does so much worse? I, I will let the next speaker address that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be, to be clear, do you still do data equilibration on Clarabel and then solve when you turn off the pre-solvers? Yeah, yeah. We so, so the equilibration step is just trying to make that, just that linear set of equations that we solve better conditioned. But do you pass that same one to Mosec or no? No, no. We, we let them do whatever they want. So er, er, all, of the, all of the results here are just default settings on everything. I mean, probably they do some internal equilibration. or You should think of it as scaling, internal scaling of your problem. I would be extremely surprised if that didn't go on. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's down to two things. One is that, um, like I said, it, in the end, what you're solving is, what you're doing is just Newton's method. And we're solving it very quickly, one, because we're faster at computing those steps, because we have a, a sparser and smaller system to factor. And then the second, which, I mean, that's clear. And then the second reason is that we end up taking fewer steps, mostly because we haven't erased the strong convexity from the problems that was there. Um, by, by putting things into second order cone form. Yeah. So how does it compare with other methods like AGMN, like SCS? Yeah, yeah. So, so we tried also that. I didn't put it on the slide. And the answer is that if you allow uh, the solver to run with default settings, then 
uh, SCS or OSQP will be roughly the same sort of performance level. But that's because they're solving to 10 to the minus 4 or 5 relative accuracy, and we're at 8. Um, which is fine. Like, you usually don't want to solve to 10 to the minus 8 or 9 accuracy anyway. Um, but the, the first order methods really struggle when you get to higher accuracy than that. So if I were to compare like for white bike degree of accuracy, and it was high accuracy, we would win. If it were 10 to the minus 4, then an ADMM method would win. Yeah? Sorry, but all those questions, why you can you, you can actually use uh, less time steps and what other methods can? That is uh, what is known as an open question, which means I don't know. I, I don't, we, don't have a, we don't have a good understanding of why the number of steps goes down when you preserve convexity in the problem, but it's something that we're interested to know. It's just some, so at the moment, it's just something that we observe. When you have a quadratic objective and you do it this way, it takes fewer steps. OK, so now I want to go on to SDPs. So right, about 15 minutes. OK, quick survey of SDPs. OK, so I said that my step equation looks like that. And the only thing that's changing is h. What's h? It's the Hessian of the barrier function for my cone. And how big is h? Well, when my cone is an n by n matrix, h scales like n squared by n squared. That's bad. So when I have an SDP, that block h, if I have a really big constraint, blows up and it completely wrecks my efficiency. So for problems up to maybe size, I don't know, 25 by 25 size constraint, it's really fast. Once you get up to, say, 100 or more variables in your um, semi-definite constraints, it really starts to drag. So what we want to do is to find a way of um, reducing the size of that block. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, in the second half here. So OK, so let's talk about uh, chordal decomposition. So uh, there's this idea of chordal graphs um, and sparse matrices. So let me define a set of nodes, one, two, three, four, um, and a set of edges, which connect some of um, those nodes. And a graph is just a collection of nodes and edges. And we say that the graph is chordal. This is called a cycle. I have four things in a loop. If every cycle of four has a piece going across, then I say that it's chordal. And if I have a chordal graph, then if I give you a collection of uh, vertices and their edges, then I can split it up into what are called its cliques, which are uh, fully interacting little groups. OK, so those are, those are called maximal cliques. I take this one. And if every one of those edges was connected to another one, I would add the other one to make that clique maximal. So you can think of these as like fully interacting subsystems on my graph. And what this has to do with semi-definite programming is that if I take a matrix and I just think about its pattern of possible non-zeros, then I can think of every row or column as one of the edges. So here's the first column, corresponds to that, um, that vertex there. And then if I have um, a value linking two of the um, terms, then I put an edge. So when I have, if I take this matrix and I turn it into a graph, if that graph is chordal, then what it means is that I can partition this uh, matrix into a collection of overlapping dense blocks um, like that. So I have this dense block, uh, this blue one and the red one. And the green one is dense in the sense that if I reordered the rows and columns, they would form a dense um, click. And there's this really nice theorem called Agor's theorem that says that if I have S, um, which is this matrix which is um, uh, chordal, then it's positive definite if and only if I can make S as a sum of these blocks, each of which are themselves positive definite. So I don't have to worry about the whole matrix being positive definite. I just have to worry about the green one the blue one and the red one individually being positive definite, and them all adding up to S. OK, so what that does for me is that if I take my problem, here's my problem as I had it before, quadratic objective, and then some uh, linear function of some matrices A and some S, which is in a cone. And if these terms here collectively form a chordal pattern, then what I can do is I can break that thing up into a collection of smaller overlapping blocks. And so instead of having one massive great big S, I have a bunch of small, well, there's more of them, but a bunch of smaller matrices. And so I get one uh, SK for every clique, 
and the sizes of those cliques are all smaller. So this is like a standard method, and um, what has it done for me? It's allowed me to take a great big semi-definite program and break it up into a problem that is actually bigger, but where all the cones are themselves individually smaller. The problem with this is that sometimes it sort of backfires, and I want to show you how it backfires. So here I have, a, here in the top left, I have a bunch of overlapping blocks, and they overlap only by a little bit. So the green one is a small thing, and I probably want to treat it on its own. But on the right, I have one big green one and one big red one, and it doesn't seem like maybe it would be so smart to break that up into two cones of size n minus one. It would probably be a bad idea to do that. So I need to somehow identify cases like the ones on the left and keep the small cones, and things like on the right, I should um, re-merge those cones. So we have um, this idea called clique merging, and the way um, you can do it is by forming what's called the clique tree. So I find um, some cliques here, and so that, that whole group there is a clique, and then I get um, some subclique there, which is the green ones, and then I get these red ones, and then I get those blue ones. Okay, so that's my clique tree. I have this pattern of cliques and how they all relate to each other. And the, the upper bit of each block is what's called the separator. It's what separates the things below the line from the stuff above. And what I can do is I can try to merge blocks by inspecting this clique tree. So what was done? So this is not the way we do it. I'm going to show you what we did in a moment. But if I just had this clique tree, what I could do is I could look either at parent-child relations or at siblings, like the green and the blue one, and I could ask, does it make sense to, to merge those pairs? And, okay, so I could just check all the pairs and see which ones it makes sense to merge. If you look at the figure on the left, what is the best thing to merge, though? The best thing to merge is the upper left-hand block, this thing up here. Well, it makes sense to put that into one smaller block. This, this must be an NPR problem, right? If yes, got, finding the best one, yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. You're doing some heuristics to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, so I want to merge those. That would be a reasonable one to merge. Uh, the problem is that the red and the blue are not related in a parent-child or in a sibling uh, relation, but they're in like a, a, like a uncle-nephew sort of relationship. So, okay, so, that's, so it hasn't worked. And the clique tree that I get is not unique. There's more than one way to get a clique tree out of this graph. So I, got, I sort of got unlucky. There are other clique trees I could have used. I could have used this one and then the red and the blue are siblings, or I could have used that one, and then the red and the blue are parent-child, but because I get to choose what's on the slide, I got unlucky and I got the one in the middle. So what should I do? Well, so instead, what we do is this. We use what's called the reduced clique graph, and that is, if you like, the union of all possible clique trees. So there exists all of these different clique trees, and the different cliques are connected in different ways across them. We can just ask, what's the union of all of them? And in this case, it happens to be this fully connected um, system of, of cliques. It's not always like that. It's not always fully connected. But I can form this reduced clique graph. And now, for every edge here, I can ask, does it make sense to merge? So instead of taking any clique tree and asking what are the pairs to merge, I say take every clique tree and look at merges that way. OK, so that's what we do. So we say, I'm going to compute edge weights. I'm going to ask roughly what is the value of having two things separately versus having um, one thing combined. And I just make some esti estimate of the computational complexity of having it one way around or the other. So we use this metric, which is taking the cube of the number of um, vertices in each clique. And why do we take the cube? Because if I were projecting these cones, which is what you would do in ADMM, that is the optimal thing to do. CPU weirdness aside, that's the optimal thing. Um, and then we just pick the one that's biggest and we merge it. So we get uh, that merge there, and then we consolidate and we recompute all the edge weights, and then we just keep going until it stops being advantageous. Yeah. For us, for interior point, that's not obviously the right thing to do because this edge weight uh, is taking the cube of every block, but really it seems like it should be something like the sixth power of every block. So how do we decide to keep this one for interior point? Um, we tried all possible powers and picked the best one, and it turned out to be this one. Okay, so we don't have a good explanation about why that's the best one, but it works. Okay, so um, now I show you one more thing, and that's this benchmark. So this is the SDP-lib benchmark, and these problems are too big to solve, for the most part, directly with an interior point solver. You could do it with ADMM, so SCS would work, 
Uh, we have a, a Julia-based ADMM solver called Cosmo. It works there as well. Um, but if you do it with interior point, this H block, the Hessian of the barrier function for this huge cone in these problems is just too big. Um, so what we do is we apply this chordal decomposition uh, in Rust, and you end up solving roughly 80% uh, of the problems. SCS, so now I am using an ADMM solver, can solve them. It can iterate, because the cones are um, at least projectable, but it doesn't get you to the optimal solution. And Mosaic does not have, as far as I'm aware, any internal decomposition method, and so it struggles with problems beyond a certain size. Okay, so I'm nearly out of time. I just say one more thing. You're now thinking to yourselves, this is awesome. Where do I get it from? And what you can, yes? Okay. You're politely agreeing with me. So, um, well, you can go there. If you go to clarabel.org, that is the, the main site for the solver, and you'll see many uh, examples, code snippets, a little bit of about the algorithm, uh, a bunch of documentation about the different cones and so on. And it will also take you through to the distributions, the source distributions for everything. So if you actually want to see the code, you just put the language you want in front of the URL, um, and you can just see the Julia code. It's all on GitHub. Uh, or you can just install it directly in the Julia package manager. So if you just add Clarabel in Julia, it will just install. Um, same with Rust. You can either directly get the source code, or if you go to crates.io, you can just add one line into your uh, Rust project, and it will just automatically work. Um, Python, you can do it through pip if you want. Uh, C++ is a little bit harder um, to get it to work. It's not one line. And R is also available on GitHub, or you can just use it through um, CRAN. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take more questions if you have.